land problem. Give us a little bit about your background. Yes, my name is Munyaradzi Nike. So as a war veteran, I regrouped with my fellow cadres and we formed an association for the war veterans, those who had fought through the struggle. And the government recognized our association as early as um, in 1993, we had a number of vettings, but officially and legally, the act was passed in parliament in 1997 when we actually were recognized as a welfare organization. I mean, that's a number of, how many, first of all, how many war veterans are there with approximate living war veterans in Zimbabwe? Um, we have a Department of War Veterans Affairs mm -hmm. in the Ministry of Defense because that's where we fall into uh, the Ministry of Defense. Our uh, right now, provincial field officer is here. Right now, our, our number um, ranging from between 40 and 45,000. Uh, I am, my name is Karagazai Kanda. I was born in on the 30th of September 1954, left and went to join the armed struggle in 1975. I was trained in Tanzania at Morogoro, and I came back to fight in the front in 1976, in August, and I fought in Tanguena sector and rose uh, to be a field commander during the war. Um, after the war, I joined Ministry of Youth and then the Ministry of Political Affairs and now I'm with the, I'm with the Ministry of Defense but after the war I also went to university and studied for a bachelor degree an honors degree in politics and administration mm. yeah. and I'm currently studying for my MBA degree. Was it your understanding initially that you were going to be given land as a, re as a reward for having fought in the war and having helped to liberate the country. What was, your, what, was the, what was the original promise? Yes. You understood it. Uh, it was not a promise. Yes. It was mm. actually the cause of going to war. That was a general cause. Yes. To the main cause take of, back of, the land. Yeah. The main cause of going to war was to fight and take and reclaim the land that was stolen from our ancestors. And, um, you know, after the war, or during the war, we were mobilizing people to say, as soon as we win this war, we are going to, we are going to get land. Mm -hmm. And after that, of course, in the early 80s, the resettlement program started, but on a very low scale because uh, of the willing seller, willing buyer uh, policy. Right. The, the white commercial farmers who were owning most of the land were not willing. They were not willing to sell to the land. Part with the land. They were not willing mm -hmm. to sell the land to, to the government. To government, yes for resettlement of the people. And you know, um, during the war, since we were promising the people that as soon as we w win the, 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 the country, we will we give, you land. give you land. That didn't happen. And after 15, 20 years, yes. the, the, the people, the black people of Zimbabwe still had no land. And you know, they were asking us as, as fighters, as people who had fought during the war, to say, where is the land that you promised to give us? Yes. After the war, it's now 20 years. Mm -hmm. It was the peasants. It was the peasants now. We were now overcrowded in the communal lands. And they were saying, we are still crowded. We are still what crowded. Is happening? You people were, were saying, you support us during the war. Fight, let us fight the, the, the whites. And if we win, if we get independence, we'll get back the land. Get the, get, now, get where the is the land? So that led us to to actually uh, invade the farms, to, re to occupy the farms as a demonstration. In fact, Masringo province is the province which initiated these farm occupations in year 2000, February 15. Mm -hmm. Seven war veterans occupied a farm that has been underutilized or not utilized at all for the past 13 years. That's the farm they identified to say, if we go and settle on this farm, and the practice agriculture, I think that's the best way to make use of the land which these people do not want us to have because definitely there is nothing being done on the farm. It's only being owned, but the owner is not in the country, has left, and the owner is just underutilized, derelict land.
So when these occupations started, government definitely realized and recognized it as a demonstration. So you are actually in, in, in a province where the third Chimurenga This started. is the province where the third Chimurenga started. Now explain Chimurenga, Chimurenga. why the third one. <laughs> yes, the third Chimurenga. Let, let's start from... Yes, the first one is a resisting force from white settler occupation. Yes. When, when the whites colonized this country, our forefathers, our ancestors, actually fought them. Mm. No. Yes. yes. They, they resisted. They, they resisted. Them because they were coming to colonize us and our, our forefathers. And chief Makoni, they were actually resisting. I mean, through fighting, using they bows and arrows. Yes. They were fighting the, colo the colon uh, colonizers who had guns. Mm. So that is what we call the third, the, the first, first, first Chimurenga. And they were defeated naturally because they were they were over they were overpowered because they the whites had superior weapons. The weapons. But they, 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 they actually said we are you, you have defeated us now, but our bones will rise against you. Against you. Indicating that their spirit of a revolution yes. will not die yes. physically like they've defeated uh, our forefathers. But it is now the bones which are said to rise and fight uh, to reclaim this land are the children or the grandchildren who would still dress the spirit of a revolution. I must ask you this question. What did our ancestors, what was the loss to them? both in terms of life, freedom, etc. Yes, they lost their lives, they uh, lost their land, they lost their cattle. Their cattle, yes, they are, they are even their wives. Yes, and they, their children, able and men who were able to, 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 to even defend the country. they lost their resources. The resources. The animals, the trees, the fruit trees, and so on. So they, they I mean, basically they lost everything to the wives. How, and they, they lost their dignity. How many persons in, were destroyed uh, in terms of that war? The first Shimmeranga. Literally, we cannot exactly say the figure was so, so many, but it was literally in their thousands. It was the whole country, starting with, from Matabela land uh, to Mashana land, Manika land, and even this area. They all rose against the whites. So the losses in terms of numbers was literally in their thousands. I think definitely meant that our economy, in terms of the African economy, it was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So literally everything was transferred from the African to, to the, the white, white man, and including that was done under conquest only. Yes, it was. Definitely done under conquest, taking the fertile land where you had the flowing rivers, the, the, the big mountains, all the rich resources were, 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 were taken mm -hmm. under conquest. How then were the Africans treated by the Europeans as a colony? How were they treated in their daily life? What, what were they forced to do? Yes, you see, when we talk of the treatment of Africans, it was mainly to achieve the development of the white men's um, desires to, to become more economically empowered. So in uh, Zimbabwe, the bridges, the railway line, all was done under forced labor. Even the structures, you could mold the bricks, build the structures, everything done under forced labor. So the entire infrastructure, the entire infrastructure in, in, in the towns, in the, on the roads, on the railway line, all was done under forced labor. Unpaid or paid? Unpaid. Unpaid. Unpaid, Unpaid yes. Unpaid. And the subjugation extended up until, um, did you have any access in terms of coming into town, using any facilities. Talk about that. How, how, well, at how you would, would have, find? Well, at least you, we would have developed the towns under forced labor. We were not even allowed 
to, 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 to get into town or to walk on the pavements. They were, they were left entirely to the white, uh, uh, white settlers. Shops were restricted to the African townships. You could not get into town and do whatever you want. Even walking on the pavement was not allowed. What? Walking on the pavement in town, you cannot. What would happen? You'll be arrested. That is the white man's area. It will be a white man's area. The black person was only welcome in town as a gardener and as a house. As a, or a cook. cook. Yes. These are some of the grievances which actually motivated people to start the second Chimurenga. Uh -huh. Yes. First, initially, they were supposed to labor. And from forced labor, they progressed on to paid labor. But paid labor, it was just a pretense. They were paying the people, you see. And besides, yes. those who had become urbanized, they also a possible removal of people from, from, from the land through the Land Apportionment Act, the Animal Husbandry Act, you know. And our people were just being grouped into areas called reserves, you know, reserved for Africans. And they, 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 they were not the most uh, semi-arid regions. That's what, what was reserved for us. I wanted to know a little bit about what the war itself was like. Uh, but you, you were giving me the background for what led up to the second Chimarango, the conditions. Um, Perhaps you'll add something to it, and then begin to tell me how uh, you went into battle and what you were up against, and what was uh, your thinking at the time, a young man. Um, you know, the way we were, I mean, the way we, we took it up from the first Shimran, it was natural. Um, you could actually not tell uh, how you were recruited. The nationalists who were um, our political leaders mobilized us. They taught us about how this country was uh, uh, colonized and that incited us to go and um, take up arms. Mm -hmm. Take up arms to fight mm -hmm. uh, the whites. And the conditions under which we lived, the, the, the type of schools that we the, the, education system was so bottlenecked that even if you were very bright you couldn't go far because the schools were very few mm -hmm. and there was no fertile land to till so the, the, the life for the black okay, the, 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 the indigenous person was very difficult so we, we, we thought it better to go and take up arms to fight during the war so uh, a lot of people, young, middle-aged, uh, married, single, actually left for Mozambique, for Zambia, and sought military training in those places like Zambia, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, far abroad as China, um, Russia, and some such countries, some such um, socialist countries. And, um, when we come back, of course, um, before we went under training, we underwent military training, we stayed in camps in Mozambique. Life was a bit difficult because there was a lot of hunger in the camps, um, but we, we, we had a lot of morale because we actually knew what we were uh, waiting for. So as soon as one got military training in outside bases in outside countries, um, then one would actually be given missions either to work in the, in the various departments in the army headquarters like in Shmoyo, in Maputo, in Beira, in Tanzania, in Lusaka, and so on. But some, like myself, were actually um, taken to go and fight the real war in the front. And it was actually a, a very exciting experience. Everyone who was trained, every, 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 everyone who was military trained aspired to go and confront the real enemy, the white. <laughs> it was actually uh, an honor, and it was actually the ambition of everyone to go and actually uh, fire at the enemy. <laughs> when given your gun you after see? training, <laughs> the first thing was to go and hand out for the 
for the for, for the white settler to say yes this time you conquered my forefathers using the gun now i also have a gun let's see who will win <laughs> and definitely it was a battle of guns <laughs> and we, and we, I, we I, beat them yes and i still remember my first battle we we went to attack a certain big uh, enemy camp in the honde valley called ruda and i was the a commander of a, a section that was in control of a very heavy weapon during, I mean, in our terms, it was a very big weapon called a recoilless rifle. So it was the biggest artillery that we had. And we, we, we actually fired uh, rockets towards the enemy camp and we destroyed it. And we were very excited when it went up in flames. <laughs> <laughs> that was your first major victory. That was mm. our first battle. Yes. How many people in your unit? We were when we went to attack that uh, that camp. We were about 150. Mm. Yes, mm. but uh, the others actually went back to Mozambique for other missions. We remained in the front and organized our own local battles in in the front. How many enemy that you was in that uh, confrontation? It was difficult at that moment to, to, see, to actually reconnoiter and find out how many were there. But I think there were more than 90 enemy troops yes. in, in, in that camp. And all of you came home? Yes, yes, we were, we were all... In most cases, we, we, in we, our battles, we would experience very low numbers or losses. Yes. In most cases, no losses at all. Because with guerrilla warfare, mm. you identify your enemy, you identify the terrain, to use when you retreat without the enemy's knowledge and on attack you will definitely understand that gorilla warfare uh, used not to take uh, say 45 seconds 15 seconds is quite a lot really 15 yeah. 20 30 40 mm. seconds a minute you would expect air force to like get to your place so you discharge your fire you go the air force would come when you are already uh, out of the radius yeah but it which you yeah, are fighting it, it was oh, you mean the enemy air force? <coughs> yeah. The enemy air force would come. Yeah. We never had air force right. to assist us. Yeah. It was the enemy air force would come when we are already out of radius. Yeah, but it was not it was not smooth sailing. It was not easy. Yes. Remember, we, we were on foot. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any vehicles. So we were carrying our weapons and our ammunition uh, at our backs. At our backs, yeah. And uh, we were confronted with the enemy air force, as he says. Yes. We were in helicopters. We had only small arms that we that, that were portable, so that we could we could run uh, uh, with it carrying the, the weapons. So we were up against a very a well equipped enemy that was begged by the foreign forces. That was well, that was begged by Britain, begged by the France, America, begged by the NATO countries. You see, all sorts of, you you see. See all sorts of aeroplanes coming, and you captured some the of the Mirage weapons. bombers. Yes, the yes, whole, yes. Anyway, you were against. Yeah. Big bomber? Yeah. Yes. You would find, it, if it be a serious battle, you would find the Hawks, the, the supersonic conquers, the, 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 the Mirage planes coming in to bomb the, the, the small hill or the area you would have uh, uh, made an attack. I understand that they also use napalm on you. Yes. They used napalm. And uh, that's why we could not take long yeah. to, 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 to keep at a better position. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once the enemy air force comes, you will not manage to leave the area because they would drop the napalm bombs or uh, drop their uh, ground force from the helicopters or from the big planes. Then you are encircled and you are caught up. And I remember one day when we had a battle early in the morning, I, 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 I survived with my colleague, comrade, and we had the helicopters over our heads from 7 o'clock to half past 4. They could not catch up with us. They, they failed. But they were trying their best to encircle us to, 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 to get us surrender, but they could not because we were managing to use all the tactics we were uh, trained for in the, in the war. So when the British came to the table, they did not come to the table for any other reason outside of they were getting their butts kicked. Yes, uh, the, the, remember the, 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 the Smith regime was an extension of the British. Right. So it was because we had defeated them in the battlefield right. that they, they they agreed to go to the talks otherwise they wouldn't have agreed to go to the talks had we not actually won the, the war mm. in the battlefield i mean in the battlefield 
then why why the Lancaster agreement? Why 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 didn't you just go ahead on and wipe them out? You, you know, um, we, we 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 who were the fighting forces on the ground. We we that was our our aim to actually capture the whole country. But you know, di diplomatically, uh, if the enemy says let's let's talk and you say we don't want to talk, it will actually be against you because you will be seen as people who don't want peace, but people who are war, 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 war mongers, war -mongers. people who are, who, are, who are war hungry. Yes. So when Our leadership was very careful yes. of the effect of a, from Bush office type of a, a win or a victory. So this um, conference, uh, Langest House conference negotiations, actually brought with it peace. But the peace that we understand prevailed from amongst our leadership was that a focus on reconciliation, reconciling with the enemy in order to manage peace in the country. And then we would look into that political situation settled, that security, military situation settled. Then it actually led us to look into our economy from a better front than had we made it from Bush office. Yeah, so we could have had a lot of sabotage on the country's economy, like in Mozambique. You could have everything destroyed, and it, it means the war that you would have fought would have not actually covered a change in the system of government. And remember, it was not the yeah. infrastructure which was wrong, or the bridges or the roads, but the system of government, which we wanted to change in favor of the Africans. And remember, we were, we were, we, we had supporters, we had we had friendly countries. Front line states. Yeah, we had, yeah. We had front line states front that, line that was supporting us during the war. Mm -hmm. And um, when there was this opportunity of us getting to a table and talk peace, we couldn't refuse because, you know, the, the, the war was very damaging to our neighbors as well. A lot of resources were actually being channeled into the, into, into the river, in, into the war. So the sooner we had peace, the better. Uh, that is why we, we, we agreed uh, to come to the table and talk peace rather than fight it out in and the, if, in if the yeah, battlefield. But while we are looking at no, we, we are not regretting it. At, uh, I mean, at all. While we are looking way. at yes. this issue of um, having gained our independence through a ceasefire and something like that, we we still are made to understand that the enemy had not actually forgotten about his tactics. When we look at this land issue which is so honorable and which would mark the end of, a, of, the, of the African war that is owning land. But while least we want to look at land itself to redistribute it equitably, you would find out that while least we are trying to even negotiate for equitable land redistribution, these white settlers are taking negotiations as a way of resistance. They just enter into dialogue as a way to resist. So they don't come up with any mm, feasible um, solutions. What they want is to keep on and remain holding on to the title of land. Tuti, I've been uh, president of the Commercial Farmers Union for a little over a year now. I'm into my second term of office. David has been our director for many years as a director of Commercial Farmers Union. And David is a, is a farmer in his own right as well. So we, as farmers, we're well represented here. We try and keep politics out of our, uh, our daily lives. And as representative farmers, of course, there's a lot of political issues face us all the time. So we welcome you here. And um, hopefully we can answer your questions in an open and frank manner, however you'd like to ask them. Sure. Well, let's start off with you said you lost a lot. What is your view of how things have been going and, and what have you lost? This is your farm. No, that's right. I'm the manager. Oh, you're the manager? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with the government, how you've been treated, uh, and et cetera? Hi, how are you doing? Okay, no, what's, what's happened on this particular farm is um, we've lost that side uh, of the farm. Okay, that side over there is we used to own both sides, so that side is gone. How, how much territory? It's, it's uh, 2,500 acres. Was roughly. the original 
Was, no, it was originally 5,000. It's roughly been cut in half. I see. I had to move the game. We had a game farm here, so we had to leave the game behind. And um, that's basically it, yeah. You have to just because the, the land is taken. Mm -hmm. What do you have on this side then? You have, we, uh, have, we have the lodge. We uh -huh. have some cattle, right. uh, so citrus trees, mm -hmm. and ostrich farm. And then the game as well. We've got game on the side as well. Do you know of anyone who have been killed, any farmers who were who didn't leave and I, were Only killed? in the beginning. Not, not this year, but in the beginning. See yourself ever in a position to help the new farmer on the other side with your expertise? And all. Um, Would you consider it? No, I, th I think there's enough animosity as it is, uh, and, and the government's not trying to... Maybe, I don't know. Depends what he wants. But uh, um, it's only a game farm. He's not, he doesn't need a tractor to plow. He doesn't need at all uh, from the state. And uh, this is what I would say is a very aggressive and, and hard hard times for us as, as the farmers. Uh, sure, there's a land reform program uh, to go ahead. Uh, we don't mind that. The way it's being done is, is very detrimental to many of our members. Many of our members have lost billions of dollars uh, and have had no, no respite or compensation to, to the state. How much do, do you blame um, Britain at all for the Lancaster Agreement and not uh, putting the funds that they... The Lancaster Agreement stated that monies to pay white settlers for their land as the new government of Zimbabwe repossessed it would be provided by the British government with aid from the U.S. Diplomatic failure between our country and our president and prime minister of the United Kingdom to engage in, in a constructive way the discussion about our history, uh, how white farmers came to be what we were um, has exacerbated a difficult situation. Let me say immediately that in 1980, uh, for those of you who don't know, there was a Lancaster House conference uh, involving all the parties from Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. We were again uh, under British rule, we had a British governor here at that time, and went to Lancaster House to negotiate an independence dispensation and a constitution. And the sticking point for some six weeks, as I recall, uh, was over what authority the new government was going to have in terms of dealing with land owned by private people in Zimbabwe. Bearing in mind that at that time the uh, people involved in the War of Liberation uh, professed to be socialists and were driven by uh, socialist communist philosophy. Um, so freehold title of land and ownership as you enjoy in your own country uh, was an issue. The breakdown in what has come to be seen to be a serious, uh, certainly in southern Africa, rift between this country and the United Kingdom and to some extent your own country and the European Union has arisen primarily out of the totally different perspectives of what was agreed at Lancaster, Lancaster House, what the expectations were by members of my government, and what now appears to be the approach by the British government. I'm not blaming the British, sir. I'm just saying that my president Mugabe, uh, when he went to the first Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference in Edinburgh to meet Tony Blair, and he tells us a 
attempted to engage him on Britain obligations to our country in terms of a land reform process. And in simple terms, there was no acceptance with the new British Prime Minister of the history. The questions that we hear so much about uh, what was wrong in the past, how blacks were dispossessed of their land without compensation in terms of a colonial regime, the British South Africa country uh, company policy to the appropriation of land in this country. I mean, there's a long history lesson there. It's well recorded. But that fundamental point I make to you is now very important. Why? Because my government has carried out a land reform program where they've acquired 95% of the land owned by my members. 95%. We haven't been paid compensation. Because of the diplomatic failure I refer to between the British and my own government, you know, we might say, well, wow, you know, like here is we're in the year 2002, and still this, this question, you know, has not been resolved. What would your response be, you know, to that? You know, so some who might say, uh, you know, Africans deserve to have their land back, and, and, and they should be given money to help develop it because of what happened uh, during uh, colonialism. I absolutely legitimate question. It is a fundamental cause, as I said in my opening remarks. It's true, it's true that in the early part of this century, blacks were dispossessed by whites. My grandfather came here in 1893. He was a policeman for Cecil Rhodes, who was an arch-colonialist, I'm sure. But us as white Zimbabweans acknowledge there were wrongs in the past. We've always said we agree we must have a land reform program. But the form and process must be to build on what is good. First, uh, did, and this is a common sense question, did Great Britain, UK, benefit from uh, that period of time when they were here? The answer, of course, is yes, they profited. They made a, a, a substantial amount of money. Um, then it would, uh, if the white farmers and the Zimbabwean government would come together and then go as a united voice to the UK, not because it appears, just being a person on the outside looking in, that the powers that be have played a divide and conquer game. Uh, where there's unity, there's strength. And one time, Zimbabwe appeared to be, based on your comments, one. Now they have us versus them, divide and conquer. It's important to come together and to stand by the leadership and then to go to Great Britain and demand, as a united voice, uh, uh, them to live up to their end because they have benefited over the years from when they had a governor here. That's the first play. And the second one, is that that's, that was just a statement. And the second, well, what's your idea? So I'm curious today. We, we both accept, we all accept that there was an injustice. There should be some land redistribution. Do you have a plan written out in black and white that you can say to the Zimbabwe government, here's my plan? And would you consider this plan? Not to say it's right or wrong, but would you consider this plan? Have you ever come out with a plan other than to say, your plan is wrong, and we're being dispossessed, we're being displaced, we're being uh, uh, gentrified, if you will. You know, have you come up with a written plan? And do you have it? And if you do have it, I'd like to see it. Yeah. Do you have a plan, a written out plan? We've had many plans, let me say. Um, the, the first concrete proposals that we put forward, because in the first 10 years of independence, I described about those Halston days, we were one together, 
land reform was going ahead, the British were uh, playing their part, the Americans were not playing their part as much as we would like to because we didn't understand. Remember the British at Lancaster House said, we can't afford to deal with this issue on our own. So Henry Kissinger, who was a smart man and uh, knew more about diplomacy than we do in farming, uh, he said, it's okay. It's okay, we'll take care of this and we'll help. This is what we were led to believe. Okay. So, to 1990, it was fine. Went to Britain, 1997, to stand together with our government to say, this is what we need. But your question to me about, can we as farmers have a separate plan to lobby the government? The answer is, we don't like as farmers and Zimbabweans to go, this is a tradition and experience in our country, to go unilaterally and talk to Britain about these issues. No, that's in Britain. No, no, wait a minute. And the president is, my president Mugabe is asking, he said, has like, when we changed the constitution to say compensation for land is the responsibility of the former colonial power, why didn't you support me? Because I said, hey, I have no power as a Zimbabwean to deal with the British government. That is my government's responsibility. We have always looked to you. I mean, we're not an independent group of people who can go around the world and unilaterally make demands on other people. We want to be with the government to make these obligations. Mr. Mr. Hazlitt? Yes, sir. Mr. Hazlitt. Uh, and sir, thank you for calling me, sir. Uh, you do have the power because I have read statements all the way back in New York yes, sir. that has come out by way of the white farmers. I have read statements that so you do have an opportunity to shape the opinion by voicing by uh, voicing your position. And the same way you can voice your position in opposition or disagreement. You can also voice your opinion. So I, I just want to disagree with you on that part. I think that you can't say I oppose on this part, and then when you have an opportunity, as the, as the president asked you, you say, "No, I, I'm not going to say nothing because we're not, we're not, we don't have an opportunity. We don't have a right to have an opinion. We don't have a right to have a voice as the government. You have a voice sometimes, and you don't have a voice other times. Unite, in my humble opinion, and I'm only on the back by mission. I've only been here for a couple of days. I only have but limited information." Unite with this government, and together this government and white farmers, and send that message across the media, across America, across the world, that you're united, and then go forth and have a plan behind closed doors where you sit down and you have a plan and say, we're going to stick together, they're going to come at us with this question, they're going to come up with this this way, but we're going to stay united. Because I think that Britain owes a, 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 a Zimbabwe. And I think America has a role to play also is, is by this delegation led by Councilman Charles Barron, we was even speaking to America, they have a role to play as well. But if the, if, if the white farmers and the Zimbabwe government stand together, I think we can get some of the things that you rightfully deserve. We just, I have nothing. I thank you for the advice, Chair. Uh, uh, this is why you're a politician and I'm a farmer. And I know how to, to make cattle fat how to grow corn and those things. And that's why we're totally inadequate to deal with the <coughs> political issues which we relied on our government, sir, to, to deal with, with the British government. Because we're a farmers union who's to protect and promote the interests of our members and we know how to protest about prices. You know, when the world market prices are bad and the Americans are dumping maize and taking subsidies and we're unsubsidized. We know about those things, sir. But this partisan politics and so on, every time we put our hand in the fire, damn, it gets burnt. Can sir. you see how the U U UK could be using you? Can you see how they could be I, playing I, your I, argument I'm against? quite certain that lots of people are manipulating us. Yeah, I just want to swing it to Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, <clears throat> see, I don't know how you give the appearance of being politically you know, naive and innocent, you're just a farmer. But I'm telling you, in, in America, we've, we've gotten a lot in the press from your farmers 
well, yes, that sir. have come out in the press that shows that they're quite politically astute and, 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 and it's not just farming. And that's why we're here also, because we've, we've, we've gotten stuff in the press uh, from our white farmers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like just putting our cards on the table and that there was a lot, as you have uh, mentioned, a lot of the farmers were with, and they have a right, because this is a democracy, uh, to be with, which, which also uh, gives credence to our concern and, and gives validation to that this is a democracy in progress, it's a work in progress that you were, you can sit here and say that, you know, white farmers were with the opposition party, some were with, you know, so democracy at work. But there's a lot of politics around farming, and it's more than just making that cow's belly, you know, big in the maize. But let me let Adam ask and then come over here. At, at some point in your <coughs> presentation, you mentioned something to the effect of a uh, the British government uh, was trying to help all the African nations equally, or to some extent trying to do their part and their responsibility. <coughs> and I say that because, um, to my knowledge, the British helped the uh, Kenya, right? The, the, the nation of Kenya with something like 532 million pounds over a decades period in a similar land uh, redistribution program. Whereas in this case, in a 15 year period from 1980 to 1995, when the Lancaster Agreement was, was broken, they had only helped with something to the effect of 35 million pounds compared to 532 million pounds. So perhaps that's why this government uh, had no recourse other than to start their own land redistribution program because they were left out in the cold, so to speak, by the British government. Yeah. Every meeting we've had, we met with government officials, we met with the U.S. Mm -hmm. embassy, and we wanted to make sure that we heard all sides of the story in, in open meetings, because we've been hearing a lot of stuff in the United States about what was happening in Zimbabwe. So we are on a fact-finding mission, and we wanted to keep it as open as possible. Even in the U.S. embassy, they allowed us to bring in, to take pictures and stuff, and in all of the meetings we have with government officials, we just want to keep it open, and we thought your input would be important because you had information uh, that can be helpful uh, to us, and we just want to get all sides of the story. That, 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 that's absolutely fine, but we were not told this when the um, meeting was set up. We were not told what? it was an open meeting. I was told that it was a meeting with a delegation from the United States. Not, not Is that true? Do you have problems yeah. with this story? I have problems with the press thing in here, yes. Really? I mean, there's nothing to hide. No, we don't have anything to hide. And plus, we're going to talk to the media, and you're going to talk to the media. And people have been talking to the media. Um, the press. Oh. Um, with our office. Okay, the Herald has a mission against us. Um, oh, so, okay. I would rather not to be talking to, to the Herald. Well, he's a piece of the class down here. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. So, our only uh, intention was just to have open meetings, as many open meetings as we can. We just met with the farmers, you know, media was right there, pictures, press, cameras, nobody had yeah. a problem. We're, it's all right. You need to know that we, we talk to, to the press on yeah. a daily basis. Yeah, that's fine. That's oh. absolutely fine. Can I just explain our work? We are a um, medical human rights organization, okay, and we deal with victims of violence, okay? So client confidentiality to us is everything. Um, if the clients to choose to talk to the press after they have seen us or before they have seen us, that is their um, choice. We don't talk to the press about what, about individuals. Yeah, <laughs> don't, no, not I'm in these just, offices. Yeah. Okay, I understand that. Yeah. I'm just saying that you, you, I don't know if the client confidential thing works when you're talking to other media. Maybe here. Oh, when we, we never talk about names. Right, and that's what we didn't expect you to do no, that here. That. So if, even yeah. if the press here, um, what you've been saying has been heard around the world, it's been mm. heard all over, so it would be, we wouldn't expect you to yeah, name a name in front of the media yeah. here. Yeah. 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 We just, just, we, yeah. just the problem with the press. Not even us in yeah. private, yeah. we wouldn't expect you to um, say any names. So our, our mission is to get both sides of the story. And that's why the meeting with you for us today was very important because we want to make sure that we don't just hear one side. Okay, well, we appreciate you requesting to meet us. Um, okay, we've yeah. met with the uh, government officials, several ministers. Uh, today we met with the U.S. <laughs> Embassy, with the uh, White Farmers uh, uh, Association. Now we want to meet with you, as well as the MDC. 
We're going to meet with the MDC and Daily News. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, so no, then we'd like to... Julian said that we are a human rights organization that has been in existence from 1993, dealing with people who have had experiences of organized violence and torture. So that's either pre-liberation or during the 1980s or since 1990 when there was a fair amount of intimidation. And then in 1998 with the food riots when there was a huge upswing in um, state organized violence. Um, we have a long record of, of publications. We have over 70, 76 publications to our name investigating the effects of organized violence and torture on the communities. Okay, so we've done a lot of retrospective studies on what happens to communities who have had violence used against them, um, what the, the long-term medical and psychological sequelae are to that. In the year 2000, when um, there was the, the um, defeat in the referendum and violence stepped up considerably, we then started seeing a lot of fresh violence, a lot of new politically motivated violence from both sides, okay, we won't beat about the bush about that, and we're a completely non-partisan organization. And then we saw an upswing in violence each time there was a by-election. So when there was a by-election going to happen in an area, there would be an immediate upswing in, in violence. Okay, so let's just open it up. Have you had any documentation of rape camps? We have not had documentation of... We do not comment on anything that we have not actually physically seen in this office. All right? That, that is our mandate. Is Unless the victim has walked through this office or through... We have a number of doctors who work for us in the, in the rural communities. Unless they have been physically visualized, we do not comment. We have had... 10 rape victims that we have seen this year that have been involved in politically motivated rape. Okay, they have been told that this is happening to them because of either their husband's beliefs, their own beliefs, or they have been caught up in, in political violence. And let me ask you, were those 10, were they with any particular party or against the party? Uh, un unfortunately, all of them were members of the opposition party. And when you say opposition? The, the MDC. I dare say if you put uh, an office like this one in London, you would get a few cases too. Yeah, that's not now that's not to blame uh, we're talking about, or yeah. even the Prime Minister. No, we're talking about politically so, motivated right. rape. I'll start by introducing you to the Minister of Justice, Legal and Environmental Affairs, Minister Chinama The I've already been introduced as the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, I'm also in that capacity the leader of the House. Uh, what this means is that I'm in charge of government business in Parliament. And uh, I have been in this capacity since 2000, since the election of 2000. I'm also in the highest um, uh, executive body of our party, which we call the Politburo. And I'm the Secretary for Legal Affairs in the party. I, I have been a member of the ruling party since its inception as a youth. I joined the youth um, wing of our party in 1963. Before I was minister, I was attorney general from 1989 to 2000. Before that, I was a senator and chairman of the Senate Legal Committee. And of course, before that, I was in legal practice in the private sector. I thought uh, I should just give you that uh, brief. I want to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you for coming to, to, to Zimbabwe. You know, Mr. Charles Barron, the leader of the delegation, and your entire delegation are most welcome. Please feel home, away from home. Uh, and I hope that uh, we have not disappointed you in any way in the manner that we have received you. Uh, we want to thank you most sincerely for the courage that you have found to come to a country which has been demonized. And which, in fact, I'm sure before you left, you were made to feel that uh, we are a country which is under, which is in a turmoil. And clearly, of course, your personal safety would have been uppermost in your mind before you came here.
So I'm happy that uh, you found the courage and the open-mindedness to want to come to see the situation for yourself. We are a very small country uh, of 13 million people. We have just had our census in August. I don't know what figures it is going to throw up, but we think that we are around 13 million people. We have no territorial ambitions on any country, on anybody. We have no world ambitions, small as we are, we are too small to entertain any world ambitions. Our only ambition, and it's a burning ambition, is that uh, we gain access to our own resources. And also that we are able to be left by ourselves to control our own destiny, small as we are. I know this is a very difficult uh, thing in the world we live in, but uh, essentially what drives us is the ambition to have access to our resources and also to drive our own destiny. We are happy that you came because it affords us an opportunity to tell our story. Our story has been distorted to a point where, for instance, when we read about ourselves as leaders, and also when we read about our president, when we read about our country, we can't recognize ourselves. Basically, we are put out as beasts and so forth. And we know we are not beasts. So when we read about ourselves and how the extent to which we have been demonized, distorted, we clearly cannot recognize ourselves or even our country. We almost come to a point where we think they must be telling a story about some other country that we know not about. So I'm very happy that you know you, you came to, uh, to, 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 to see us. Our other ambition, of course, to the extent that we, we have a voice in world affairs, is basically to demand a fairer and just world information and communication order. What we have experienced, more particularly in the past two years, or past three years, has been that the, the world press and media is dominated by few interests to a point where it's only their perception about the world or what they want the world to be, which in fact is propagated. And we believe that I think we need to have some a fairer information and communication order so that even the voice of small countries, of small peoples, is also heard on the world arena. And unfortunately, we have not had that privilege to have our voice heard internationally and on the world scene. We also want to engage the developed countries in a genuine way. What we mean is that we have interests which are always trampled upon by the developed countries, especially in the economic, in the economic field. We believe that we should engage the developed world so that we come up with a, a fairer and a just world economic order where we no longer must no longer continue the same economic relationship where we are just the mere suppliers of raw materials and we export jobs on a daily basis and the prices are all determined from even of our own resources. Whether we are talking of minerals, we are talking of anything that we produce, we, the prices are determined outside Africa. The terms of trade are determined outside Africa. And we believe that uh, much of our underdevelopment uh, is a result of these inequitable uh, economic terms in the world arena. So we are very much uh, active in all third, third world uh, uh, organizations. How are you doing? Coming here. Oh, you read about us coming? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Nice to be in Zimbabwe. You read it in the paper? Yes, in the tent. Okay. Yes. You said we were coming, huh? Yeah. For a week. Huh?
Are you enjoying? Yeah. Yes. We're doing well. Thank you. No, I haven't. Can we take a photo? Yes. Um, somebody can take your photo. Where's the note? Any better, any worse, or the same as last year? The problem is uh, Mili Mili. Mili Mili sugar, cooking oil, that's the only Mili Mili problem. is our staple food. Mm. Yes. What about the, uh, the land question? Ah, the land and the farm people are very happy about it. Oh, very yes. ape about it? Yes, they are ape about it. I wish if the rain can come, people will be okay. Yeah, that's the only problem. That's the problem. No rain. No rain here. No rain. That's the problem which is causing all this People no too. rain to drown. Yeah. It says no rain. No rain. That's what the problem is. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, everything is okay. Yeah, it's okay. We are staying nice. Do you think Mugabe is doing the right thing with a repossession uh, of the farms? He's doing everything in good channel. Good channel. Um, he's doing everything in good channel. Only drought. Ah, we are suffering. How many times do you eat every day? Do you eat one more than one meal a day? <laughs> one yeah. meal a day. This special rice. That's the only thing we are using. Rice. He wants to help you. He wants to help you. He wants to help you. So we just to cook. Watch yourself. Move back. Oh, how did he go? He's going to take. Three shots in the scrum. Your staple food in this country. Yeah. Sansa, you know that, that that one I gave you to taste. My grandson always tell me to to watch news every day. So I was so excited about you coming. So I didn't know how God is great. You were just passing by. So I saw you. I'm so happy. Thank you. And you can where I say I was born here. That's my great mommy's place. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good. So you need this for me, Oh, yes. Yeah. How are you using this more than one? Yeah, but I like this one. Yeah, it's cool, James. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about the first stove in the church. Yeah. Was, uh, I remember these. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. It's good we'll to be here. Yeah. Good. Thank I'm you. very few free. Yes. We are very liberal. We, we welcome you very much. Sorry. Uh, we are very glad that you've come here to photograph us. Say that we know, we know that you, you, you love us and you, yeah. you remember me, remember, remember us wherever you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We thank you for that. We, we are just glad. That you are poor, we should have to give you something better. We should take that this photograph. Yeah. Should have you paid you a lot. Because we know that it, it is expensive to come here mm -hmm. and you you whatever, take spend a, all, 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 a lot of your at the end demand to take us photographs. Uh, we, we could have paid you for that. We are very much interested. Ah, uh, very good. Yeah, we are very yeah, much it's only, Yeah, it's only made of this economic attitudes, yeah. which are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, we, are, we are needing a, a tough life, but yeah. We want your address. You want my address? Yes. Okay. Bye to the people. Bye.
how are you, sir? Uh, James Davis from Brooklyn, New York. We love you. Okay. Right? We love Zimbabwe. We're praying for Zimbabwe. Yes. We get all the evil forces away from Zimbabwe so Zimbabwe can prosper. Okay? Beautiful. We love you. Look here, look here. Look here, brother. Zimbabwe. How you feeling, brother? Oh, fuck. I'm Councilman James Davis, all the way from Brooklyn, New York. From New York. New York. I'm what do you do? I'm an elected official, a politician, they some say. More importantly, today I'm your brother. Nice too, and we're praying for you, bro. Help remove some of this poverty. Help, oh, okay. help the community bring about You'll do that sometime. Okay, my friend. <laughs> we like our bishop as well. Yes. He, he's the minister. The minister is seated right in front there, followed by That's myself. No, no, no. It's different. It's bi different. It's di Bishop who? Enginas. Enginas. Enginas, yes, from South Africa. Oh. Uh, okay. But here we worship under Mawewe, he's the minister of Zimbabwe. Bishop Mawewe. Mawewe, yes. yes. How old is the church? The church was formed in 1960. Uh, seven, uh, no, 1924. 24? Yes. Wow. By Enginas, Lehanyan, the late. And this is where you pray every weekend? Yes, this is where we pray every weekend. Wow. Uh, What's pray? special about this church? Tell us. Uh, the special about it, we got uh, the prophets who would uh, chase away the bad spirits. You know, we are haunted by bad spirits, some of us. Those bad spirits, they can be chased away by the water which we pray for. We pray for the water, we sprinkle on their faces, the demons will run away. Where's the water? Uh, the water, it was right there, but I think it's finished. It, it, is it okay if I film? Yes, with pleasure. Uh, I would like you to take the food. It's pleasure. Thank you. What is your name? My name is Andrew Machaya. Spell your last name. My M A C H A Y A. Right. Right. And what is your role for the church? My role is I am the 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 minister here at Mbari. Right. Yes. At this location. Right here. At this location. Yes. Is it, is it possible for me to speak to them? Yes, you can. Do you, I'll, I'll ask them if I can speak to them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they will understand you very much. Yeah. You translate on that? Oh, they will understand, but I will translate in Shona. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to do that. Yes. I'm like fine. Do we join them? Yes, you can join them. The ladies, they sit too. You sit where men are. The ladies, they will sit where ladies are.
Councilman from the New York City. Because we are the Reverend. <laughs> Reverend Charles Bagus. Charles Barron. Charles James, James Davis. Davis. James Davis. Of Brooklyn. And Assemblyman Adam Clayton Powell. Powell. Uh, Assemblyman Adam Powell. Yeah. They are all from New York City. This is Paul Washington. Preach the word of God to us. With pleasure. Thank you. First of all, let's say praise the Lord. Praise all right. I want to thank you so much. We came from New York City to do politics, but we were glad that we ran into a spiritual service because all of us are Christians, or most of us are Christians, believe in the Lord. We believe in God. We know that politics is one thing, but God is still on the throne. And we thank God that God is still on the throne. And we're going to go forward ever. So some of us, are, most of us are from New York, but we are Africans from New York. They okay. stole us from here 400 years ago, and we're glad to be back home. Okay. Glad to be back home. Glad to be back home. you got to show me some of the moves so I can go like that. <laughs> here it is. in bringing pressure to bear on Blair. So you realize the responsibility that he must bear and to bear towards, not just them, but towards the, the majority of the people of the country. It's a new stance and we fight for society. Thanks for your listening to that. <laughs> And we, we are impressed that we were open to seeing whom, whomever we wanted to see. Uh, there's, there's many uh, times where you don't get a chance to see the opposition, see the white farmers, see people who don't agree with you. 
meet those who do agree. That's and, right. and I think that's what gives this trip credibility. Um, your host left us alone when we said we needed to be left alone to yes, visit. Sure. Uh, that happened. And we were able to meet with the people and they spoke freely. And I know I can say on behalf of some of us, a lot of the myths have been exploded uh, once you meet the reality. That's right. Because uh, unfortunately, in this world, reality is almost irrelevant. It's perception that counts is what people make of the reality and the interpretations of it. So we're just honored that we are able to freely move about the country and talk to supporters as well as critics. That's right. And I think that's what gave this a very, very um, powerful, powerful impact. And that's what I think makes this powerful impact. So when we go back and we're asked by the press, were you able to talk to this one? Yes. Were you able to talk to opposition? Yes. White farmers? Yes. Were you able to see some farms? Yes. We had to go to school. We hope to make two schools and see our peasant farm, general owned farms. We both had to see how it's working. So, so all that maize was not produced. But then how can you blame the farmers if it's because of the drought? I'm talking about the commercial farmers that would have produced irrigated maize were not able to produce it because they were off their farms. Okay, correct me then. I may be wrong. I was under the impression that 70% of the maize was grown by the peasant farmers on their communal land. Yes. Is that not true? That is true, yeah. Uh, they do grow a large percentage of the maize. Uh, Communal farmers do. But when that crop fails, mm -hmm. your commercial farmers who have the ability to irrigate their, their fields, okay, the ones that have the infrastructure available to irrigate, that maize was not produced. The that 30%? If, yeah. If that maize had been produced, mm -hmm. it would have gone a long way to alleviating the problem that we have now. But we still would have had to make up for the yes, 70%. Yeah, sure. Okay. Just wanted to make that clear. But there's no strategic reserve. Right. If your strategic reserve is there, okay, and you have a crop failure in the communal area.